Okay. okay, we're we're gonna get started. Well, I want to welcome everybody here today. This is a special Grand Rounds for us. Uh, it's great to have a, an important for us to have a forum on our federal immigration policy. Sandy Fanwick and I were supposed to du uh, double team this, but we've sort of got pulled in different meetings. So you just got me. I'm Kevin Churchwell, the president and COO of the hospital. It's a pleasure to be here. It's important for us to be here. You know, so many of the issues that we discussed have a direct impact on our patients and our families and on the health and well-being of all the children that we serve. You know, we know that there are a lot of problems that are really coming across uh, with the immigration policies that are being put forward. One is that, an example is that many of our families, some of our families, many of our families are having a hard time making the decision to actually just go for Medicaid because their fear is that if they apply for Medicaid, then they'll be identified. And being identified, they go, they're going through a system that is not The consequence is, of course, if we have children who don't have health that's got to be worked out. I know we're going to be talking about that. You need to know, and I know you know this, that whenever our fam wherever our families come from, we we'll always do everything in our power to ensure they get the care that they need, the care that they need without fear. And that's our goal. So we brought a great group of external and internal experts together today to discuss the resources available, not only to our patients and families, but to you. And I know you serve as many of them for their trusted advisors on these issues. I know many of our families may need assurance. Uh, are they doing the right thing, speaking out for their kids, speaking out for their children's needs? Please know that that's the right thing and that we stand with them. We at Boston Children's are trying to stay on top of these issues. Uh, as you know, they're very fluid. They continue to be, uh, I just saw, I was watching last night in terms of another issue I didn't know about. <laughs> that the administration is trying to push forward, that we've got to really get our arms around uh, as we move forward. An example uh, of these fluid issues, of course, is the public charge issue or the public charge rule that was released last year. You know, we along the hospital and dozens of you submitted formal comments in opposition. Uh, and you'll hear from the panel uh, about the status of that rule. Please know that we have assembled a high level working group here at Boston Children's. It's chaired by Laura Wood. Laura, why don't you stand up? <laughs> She's our chief nursing our office officer on immigration issues. And any suggestions or concerns raised at this forum will run through that working group. Uh, the group meets regularly to discuss patient impact and consider ways we can advocate for uh, for our patients and families to try to make it as easy as possible for, the, for the, them to get their children's care. So you, we don't know what the future is going to hold, but uh, our goal is to be at the forefront of this work, to monitor it, to, to advocate, to advocate, to advocate, and to push what we know is important forward for the care of our children. So I want to thank everybody for coming today. I think this is going to be very important and look forward to the dialogue. So I'll turn it over. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, happy Halloween. It's nice to see a little bit of Halloween flair in the audience to keep us joyful as we talk about these very serious topics. Before we get going, I just wanted to uh, reiterate um, what Dr. Churchwell said, which is that this is, of course, a time where information is always changing, where um, we believe we know what to expect and our patients and families know what to expect with regard to their benefits, um, the, the rights that they have here in varying um, stages of the immigration or naturalization process, and then very very quickly, uh, things change. And so this creates a tremendous amount of anxiety and can potentially lead to a chilling effect um, for families who really, we want to remain engaged with their child's medical care, to come here, to feel safe, to fee feel held, and to know that we're partners with them. 
Um, of course, we will do all that we can, um, as Dr. Churchill mentioned, to, to stay abreast of what's going on, to get information out to you, and to advocate for families so that they can continue to care for themselves and their families and their patients and our patients. Um, we have a wonderful group of esteemed panelists here, and I am going to introduce those uh, folks to you and ask them to join me on the stage. First, I wanted to just check in with Kate Adet about one thing. The slide, should I be doing that now? Just do that now? Okay. So this is just um, one slide that I'm not going to read for you word for word, but I am just going to um, give you a summary of what the thrust of it is, is that we're really here to share information, to talk about policy, to provide an opportunity for a discussion, but we are not here to go down um, sort of a partisan or a political track. Um, and so we're going to try to limit conversation to the policies. Um, um, as is appropriate given the setting that we are in. Okay, so that is my statement. Okay, great. So um, this will cue up our next um, uh, speaking presentation, but why don't I just start by again introducing our panelists and asking them to join me up here and then we will um, have our first um, speaking presentation. So just to give you a sense of the agenda today, we're going to have a couple of um, uh, about 15 minute talks from a few, a couple of the dignitaries here who have joined us from their external agencies. And then we're going to move into a question and answer period. So, um, and hopefully have a very lively and engaged discussion with you all. So I am going to um, introduce um, Katie Lambing, immig immigration attorney from the Irish International um, Immigration Center, um, often called um, IIIC. And um, may I just talk a little bit about your credentials here? Is that okay? All right. <laughs> you know, just, you know, wanted to make sure that was all right for me to take that time. Katie's an immigration attorney at the Irish International Immigration Center, where she's been practicing for two and a half years. Her current caseload includes medical deferred action cases, which will certainly be a topic we'll be focusing on today, family based adjustments and consular processing cases, tourist visa extensions, DACA, and other family-based and humanitarian cases. Before working at the IIIC, she served as an AmeriCorps attorney at Project Citizenship and Greater Boston Legal Services. She's a graduate of the University of Cincinnati and Boston University School of Law. Thank you for joining us today. Oh yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Maria Gonzalez, Director um, of Communications and Immigrant Health, here for Healthcare for All, is HCFA's Strategy and Communications Director. She also supervises outreach activities, community organizing, and the helpline. A native of Spain, Maria earned a dual degree in communications and German studies at the University of Valencia, Spain, and Bremen University, Germany. She studied journalism at Carlos III, University and worked as the editor of several specialized publications in the Madrid region. She also earned a master's degree in political science and international relations at Suffolk University in Boston. She works as an associate editor for El Mundo newspaper as the reporter of um, Noticias <laughs> Univision Nueva Inglaterra. Yes, good. Where in addition, thanks for seeing me through that, everybody. In addition, she served as a news anchor and producer. Later, she was employed as the community education manager at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Yeah, this is good. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Gail Robinson, immigration manager, Boston Children's Hospital. Gail is an employment immigration specialist and has been working in this field for over 20 years. Gail currently serves as the immigration manager in the Office of General Counsel at Boston Children's Hospital. Her primary responsibility is the management of the BCH-sponsored employment visa program, which includes over 750 E3, H1B, J1, uh, O1, and TN visas, as well as our employer-sponsored permanent residency program. 
Gail is a member of the National Association of International Educators, NAFSA, where she has presented at local and regional conferences. Gail has a bachelor's degree from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Thank you for being with us, Gail. Thank you. And finally, certainly, um, last but not least, Shanika Louise Davis, who is our Stuart J. Novick Legal Fellow from Boston Children's Hospital. She joined the Office of General Counsel as the Stuart J. Novick Legal Fellow in October 2017. And as the hospital's lead medical legal partnership attorney, Shanika's practice focuses on providing legal housing, legal support to BCH patients and their families, experiencing barriers related to housing, education, immigration, income supports, and family law. Before joining General in the Civil Rights Division of the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. She also clerked for the Honorable Frederick L. Brown of the Massachusetts Appeals Court. Shanika is currently pursuing a Master's um, of Public Health degree at Harvard um, T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She earned her B.A. magna cum laude from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and her J.D. from Northeastern University School of Law. Prior to attending Northeastern, Shanika served for two years as a United States Peace Corps Youth Development Volunteer in Romania. So thank you so much, all of our panelists, for joining us today. Now I am going to turn it over. Sorry, you were left up here all alone. <laughs> but it's great, it's great. Thank you for being here. If you'd like to stand here at the podium, please come on over. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Katie. Great, thank you, Allison. I haven't been called a dignitary since Model UN, so that was great. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit first about the IIIC. Um, we were founded in 1989, um, primarily to help undocumented Irish folks at that time. Um, we have since expanded to, um, to help everybody from every country that comes through our door. Um, right now, our clients and students come from over 120 different countries. And in addition to the legal and wellness and education stuff that we do, um, we also do some advocacy um, at the State House and national stuff. Um, our ILS team has seven attorneys, um, including our legal services director. We do free walk in clinics. This says weekly, um, formerly weekly, now they're mostly every other week um, because a couple of the places where we were doing them have closed. Um, we provide full representation as well. So um, when people come into our clinics, we give basic advice. And if it's the kind of case that we can take and we are in a position where we're able to take on new cases, um, we will represent, give them full representation. Um, in addition to that, we do pro se assistance um, for simpler forms like I-90s to replace green cards and 400s to apply for citizenship. Um, and those are things where they would meet with an attorney that we've trained um, and have their form filled out and make sure that they have all the right evidence before they submit their application. Um, we have a family-based and humanitarian focus. So that means that we do um, family-based adjustments and consular processing to get green cards for folks. We do um, asylum and refugee adjustments. Um, we don't really do asylum cases or removal defense sort of stuff. So to actually move to deferred action, um, I do want to preface this with a little bit of a caveat, which is that the IIIC actually sued the government over the ending of medical deferred action. So we are currently in um, settlement negotiations, and there will be some questions possibly today that I won't be able to answer. But I can give you the background, and I can talk about um, the, the basics of how an application goes together and what's needed. So medical deferred action is um, a discretionary grant that the government gives. It's not something that is found in a statute anywhere or in a regulation. Um, you can't find it in the INA, but if you are in a situation where you yourself are very, very ill and you need medical treatment or you have a child that is very, very ill and needs medical treatment, you can go to USCIS um, Citizenship and Immigration Services and request that they basically give you a promise that they won't put you into removal proceedings for a two-year period. 
during that two year period, um, you're also eligible to apply for work authorization, which is really, really helpful for a lot of these families. Um, deferred action itself is not an immigration status. It doesn't lead to anything permanent. It's again for two years and you can in some cases renew it, um, but you renew and renew and renew and it's never gonna actually lead to a green card or, or anything else. Um, okay. The way that you apply for deferred action is you put together a package um, that you, some of you in this room have probably helped put together or gotten doctor's letters for patients. Um, the attorney sits down and writes an affidavit with the applicant that talks about their history, when they entered the United States, why they entered the United States, and then their diagnosis and, and all of the treatment that they have received up until this point. And then if it's something that they had or were diagnosed with before they came into the US, what their treatment was like in their home country. Um, additionally, we get doctor's letters to back up the diagnosis and talk about what um, the treatment might look like during that two year period. Um, and then in addition to the affidavit and the doctor's letters, the basic biographic information form and then we provide um, evidence of the availability of treatment in their home country. Even if they weren't being treated there before, you know, what medications are available there, what <laughs> emergency services are available there and that sort of stuff. Recently, we've also been getting requests for evidence of how that treatment is being paid for, um, which was not something that was always done, but has been done for the last couple of years. The time that it actually takes to get a decision on that case once it's been submitted is not something that's published and it varies really greatly even in the cases that we have submitted. So in some cases you submit it and you get a decision within six months. Some cases um, we've had pending for over two years and they just have not made a decision and it's really hard to tell what goes into, the, into that time and, and why the government has such a, a big variation. So a news update, um, a, a lot of you probably know in August, immigration mailed out denial notices to everyone who had a pending case. Those denial notices said basically, um, if it was a first time application, you're not in lawful status right now, you have 33 days to leave the country, and if you don't, we might put you into removal proceedings. Um, those denial notices also said that blanket across the board, USCIS was no longer going to consider deferred action cases unless they were related to military cases. Um, and they also said that that change went into effect on August 6th, even though we didn't start receiving those notices until the 16th approximately, um, and no formal announcement was ever made. Wow. So, this is sort of me bragging a little bit. The House Committee on Civil Rights and Civil Liberties had hearings um, on September 11th that um, our legal services director and one of our patients um, actually testified at. Um, and then they held another hearing. This says October 28th. It was actually moved to the 30th um, where Ken Cuccinelli, the director of, of USCIS and the director of ICE both um, answered questions. Um, on September 19th, so a little over a month ago now, USCIS announced that it has reinstated deferred action because of the public outcry that went along with um, their decision to end it. But we really don't know what that means moving forward. We have not, in the month plus that has um, gone past since they said that they reopened these cases, we haven't received any adjudications, no approvals, no denials, nothing. It's not clear exactly what standards are going to be used to adjudicate these cases moving forward, if it's going to be exactly the same as it was on August 5th, or if they're using new um, standards, we don't know. Um, the only thing that we do know is that it seems like individuals who either have deferred action now and need to renew or don't have deferred action but are eligible to apply for it can submit new applications. Whether they'll be adjudicated or how long that will take, that's information that we don't have. And honestly, it's information that we didn't have on August 5th either, given the amount of time that it was taking to adjudicate some of them. Um, if you think your client is eligible for deferred action, 
or for a visa extension, refer them to our legal clinics instead of trying to do a case yourself, please. Um, our next clinic is November 5th at 3.30 in our office at 1 State Street, and you can find our clinic schedule um, online on our website because um, it does, it can change month. Okay, and I think we're saving the questions period for the end of this, so I'm going to defer to Maria now. Good almost afternoon, everybody. My name is Maria Gonzalez. I am the Director of Communications and also I'm the Director of Immigrant Health because we started seeing that we needed to step out of efforts to help our immigrant community in the last couple of years. So we all do whatever we have to do, right? So we ha who has heard about healthcare for all in here? Good, good, good. So we've been around for a while, um, since 1985, we're a nonprofit organization. We really represent the voice of consumers and patients in the healthcare system in Massachusetts. We work very closely with a national partner, Community Catalyst, and also our legal partner, Health Law Advocates, a great resource for you guys as well, because they can handle medical debt cases, appeals and, and grievances and denials of, of coverage. Um, we work in coalition, that's our model. We really push for changes and do advocacy in terms of health access, access the Affordable Care Act, Defending the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid, oral health, immigrant health, children's health, and so forth. And Children's Hospital is very involved in many of our coalitions. Um, here you have our website if you want to visit it. We have our Twitter account, Facebook account, and I'm going to be talking about the exciting world of public charge. This is really when things get really complicated because we're talking um, public benefits law and immigration law and at the intersection of both of them. So we've been talking public charge for, I think, two and a half years now. Who has um, heard the term public charge in here? Who has patients who had questions about public charge? Good. So since 2017, we heard in January that year that the administration, the new administration, was going to have this leaked executive draft to change the terms of this thing called public charge. And I'll talk about what exactly that is, but I want you to understand where we are right now so that you have the most accurate information. Then they changed the grounds to public charge for people who have to apply overseas. And that's what's called the Foreign Affairs Manual. Then they published a proposed rule to change public charge for people who are in the country and have to adjust status in the country. And we had 60 days to submit comments we had a whole campaign here in Massachusetts. That we really followed a national campaign that was very structured and organized. And we submitted around 267,000 comments. Most of them, we believe, that were under, uh, against the rule. Then finally, they had to read all those comments and they, post, they published a final rule in August, August 14th. And in that final rule, the new changes were going to were set to actually start on October 15th. However, be, because there was litigation, um, we had preliminary injunctions issued on October 11th, and not, this is where we are right now, which means the public church rule changes are not into effect. And now let's go about what's happening with public charge, what is public charge, and what is the current status. So because these proposed changes that I'll talk about are blocked, this is what public charge is right now. We're using what's the longstanding test, which has been in effect since 1999. The definition of this test is a person who's considered likely to become primarily dependent on the government for subsistence. It's a more broader approach, and but there are only two benefits considered here, cash assistance and long-term care at government expense. So those are the only two benefits that are considered to determine if somebody is going to be deemed a public charge. They do look at what's called the totality of circumstances, which is like age, family status, health, um, you see the public benefits, education. However, if the person is able to submit an affidavit of, an affidavit of support of sponsorship, somebody who's able to sponsor them at 125% of the federal poverty level, the changes of overcoming the public church test are actually very high. So that has a very big role right now. So think about any patients that you may have that may be concerned about all of this. First thing, 
you see here, the current test doesn't have anything rel related to health care unless it's the long-term care at government expense. Does that make sense? Now, even beyond this, there are many people who are not even subject to public charge. The public charge rule is about admissibility to the country in a literal sense, but also if the person is applying for a green card, that's called also ad admissibility. So who needs to be admitted? Anybody who's applying for a green card, it needs to be admitted. Those LPRs, we call those the lawful permanent residents um, or people who have green cards who leave the country for more than um, 180 consecutive days, six months outside of the country, and people who apply to enter the U.S. through the consular process. This specific rule that I'm going to be talking about is the one that applies to people who are seeking green cards inside of the U.S. And there are different rules for overseas. So very, very important for me, if you leave this room knowing that people who are applying for citizenship should not worry about public charge, we'll be able to actually handle the chilling effect, a lot of the chilling effect, because um, I think there's a lot of concern of people not using benefits, um, even though they're green card holders. Also, other people who are, not, who are not subject to public charge, refugees, asylees, and you have here some other examples, people who are applying for TPS, renewing their TPS status, DACA status, and so forth. However, if one of these categories ends up adjusting status through another avenue, for example, through a family petition, they meet somebody, they fall in love with somebody, and that person is a US citizen or a green card holder, and decide to go in that route, they will be subject to public charge. Now, I'm going to talk about the block rule. It's not in effect. And the reality is we don't even know when this will be in effect. To have a sense when DACA was um, take to a lawsuit, I think that we still have not even, we're going to see them in the Supreme Court in the next couple of months. So it's been two years. We don't know. It can take a year. We'll keep you posted. That's all we can say. Well, the block rule changes the definition of public charge to a person who receives one or more public benefits for more than 12 months in the aggregate of any, within any 36 month period, such that for instance, receipt of two benefits in one month counts as two months. They expand that totality of circumstance tests that I showed you guys that had all these other factors. They actually place weight on the different factors. So it's more like a, a formula. The very important for that is that the affidavit of support does not have the same weight that it has currently. So it's not going to be as easy to overcome. Um, and then they place a lot of um, emphasis on the income. And, you know, they're saying that having an income that is over 250% of the federal poverty level is actually a positive factor. If you look at that, that salary is actually very high for our families and it's very hard to overcome. They've added three sets of benefits, SNAP food stamps, housing, and federal Medicaid. So I'm gonna go a little bit into this Medicaid piece because people are very concerned about adding Medicaid, but at the end of the day, you're gonna see that not many people are impacted by this piece specifically. This is, even though the definition talks about benefits, this is not about benefits at the end of the day. So it's only federal Medicaid. In order to actually qualify for federal Medicaid, for the most part, you have to be a green card, hold, green card holder for more than five years. What did I say about green card holders? If they're applying for citizenship, this doesn't impact them at all. So for the most part, you're going to see this. If you qualify for the benefit, you're not going to be subject to public charge for the most part. And there are exceptions. They actually included in the finalist rule, they, um, they included exceptions for pregnant women and children or people under 21, technically not all of them. Um, young people under age 21. So those were the ones that we were concerned about. They're actually exempted to the rule. And we have here some of the programs that we have here in Massachusetts that we know are not going to be part of this rule, which is Health Safety Net, CMSP, and Muscle Family Assistance for Prucol. Who here knows who, what Prucol is? Okay, person residing under the color of law. A lot of our families have are technically undocumented under immigration law, but because under under public benefits law, they're approval and they can qualify for other benefits. So may, many of them qualify depending on income for muscle family assistance. And that is a very important thing because sometimes we have like that issue of the person, they tell us they're undocumented. We're like trying to find how to cover their services. Guess what? They actually have a pending petition with USCIS, that means that they actually technically can qualify for myself family assistance. As you can see, our health connector subsidies are not going to be a negative factor in the rule. 
And I added here WIC because we saw a lot of people dropping WIC in the last couple of years. WIC is not even being part of the proposed rule or the finalized rule. This is the litigation that I was talking um, about. There are five preliminary injunctions right now. Three of them are nationwide, so they will have to reverse the three of them in order for Massachusetts residents to even be impacted. In the meantime, they cannot use the test, the definitions, or the forms that they have created, and any benefit used until the ruling happens is not gonna be considered. So this is not gonna be retroactive no matter what. Um, I'm gonna do this one first. We're gonna talk about what are we gonna tell our patients, um, our families are concerned about this. Most, even under the blog rule, and I'm gonna take a step back. Under the current rule, you saw there are only two benefits that they take into account. So Medicaid or any kind of health insurance benefit is not counted. The only thing that you guys have to take into account is the long-term piece. Most in, under the block rule, even under the block rule, most immigrants in Massachusetts should keep their benefits because most immigrants who are eligible for public benefits are actually not subject to public charge. And most immigrants who are subject to the public charge status are actually not eligible for these public benefits. Another thing that's very important, the fact that the person is eligible for a program that has nothing to do with immigration. So this is like a different avenue. You can be eligible for a specific program and the program is not gonna uh, deny you access even though that might be considered part of the public charge process. So that's a very important question. Also, you cannot provide immigration advice. So any question on their immigration situation and adjust status, you have amazing lawyers such as Katie that can do, um, help you guys with that work. We have resources that can help you also understand these pieces, which is the Immigrant Health Toolkit. And um, you can join us. We have uh, immigrant eligibility for programs. I know that this is very complicated. Who qualifies oh, no. depending on immigration status and a oh, lot of information, some no, of the... No, um, clinics that you guys can send people to immigration and so forth. And I'm going to go back to this. Um, this. We're talking public charge for people in the U.S. Um, who are renewing studying like adjusting status here. There are other changes that we need to pay attention to that are going to impact access to health benefits for our patients and, and consumers. One thing that I want to highlight is besides the fact that they want to change a rule under the Department of State that we have a 60 day period that's going to end on November 11th to align what's happening outside of the country with Dale. this rule. So we're paying attention to that. There's a presidential proclamation that you probably guys have heard about that is going to um, require immigrant applicants, immigration applicants to show that they can actually afford their medical care or that they have health insurance. That um, is gonna be into effect, I think it's November 4th and November 3rd, but there is a litigation that was announced yesterday. So we're hoping to um, stop this proclamation. It's actually concerning because they have to prove that they actually are gonna be able to have health insurance that's gonna cover their services here. It's actually not a very easy thing to do. Um, and there's other things that we need to pay attention to, such as the citizenship question included on the census. The census is happening I think they've launched it already, like the first phases, and that can restrain people from accessing, from filling out the form. And at the same time, those are the, that's how you assign the funding for some of the key programs that really cover our families. Um, and there are other uh, issues here. We heard a lot about the medical deferred action status. There were changes in the public housing com composition to kind of like change the rules about who can live in mixed, host, um, in mixed status house households and how that uh, impacts the family's access to housing. So there's a lot of stuff happening, not just public charge, but if I leave this presentation today with you understanding that right now there's no changes to public charge, that we have the old rule, and that even if the new rule was to play, be placed into you know, our, our rules, our laws, then we will have many small cases of people being impacted by the Medicaid piece. So health benefits really is not gonna be a big problem and many people are exempt of public charge. Any questions? We're going to handle them later, right? Yes. Thank, yes. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we really appreciate these overviews. So now I'm going to ask our panelists to please join me on the stage so that we can begin um, our dialogue. Uh, 
um, we are going to be collecting some questions from individuals in the audience. As you can see, there are some folks walking around with these blue baskets. So if you have a question that you would like to um, have posed to the panel, we would greatly appreciate you um, just sort of waving down one of our volunteers and we will begin the, the question and answer period. Okay. Great. So, um, I believe this is a question that really could be posed to everyone. And so I think we'll just take an opportunity to um, go across uh, the panel and have your response. So the question is, how can we at Boston Children's Hospital support our families who ask us questions about immigration issues like public charge? So why don't we start over here with our internal panelists, Gail and Shanika. So one way to uh, support our families is to provide them with the resources that, are, that the hospital has. So uh, Medical Legal Partnership, um, also IIC, Healthful Advocates, Healthcare for All, um, and connecting them with the, um, the legal resources that can assist them, and also informing them that you know, they should keep their benefits. Mm -hmm. Anything you'd like to add, Gail? Uh, nope, Shanika said it all. Okay, great, thank you. So, um, because for the most part, they're gonna be concerned about using the health services that you guys are providing. Um, if you don't feel comfortable telling them what's happening with the rule, we're actually sending people to our helpline. Healthcare for All has a helpline that handles around 20,000 calls a year about healthcare programs. We answer questions about health coverage and so forth. And we've been sending people there to uh, talk about their specific situation. So that's 800-272-4232. 800-272-4232. Nicely. Nice. Thank you so much. Anything? Um, yeah, you can always refer people to our clinics again. Um, I think instead of trying to answer their specific questions, it's definitely a good idea in this climate, especially to have them talk to an attorney. Um, and even if it's not a case that we're able to take, we do always give advice and we can give them sort of a clear-eyed idea um, of, of what, might, what might happen for them in the future. Thank you. I also wanted to add that one of the reasons that this forum came together and um, the, the work that has been um, in progress here at Children's for uh, a number of years actually before these most recent changes is because we heard from folks on the front line who are working with patient families who began to share with us what was going on, what the changes were, what um, gave us a sense of how broadly our patients were affected, their concerns and your concerns. So again, I just want to emphasize that we do have a group that's continuing to work on this um, uh, as the situation continues to change and evolve. And you communicating with us about what's going on is um, how we, one of the ways that we stay abreast of, of that and can um, continue to step up our efforts in our communication to the appropriate resources that we're identifying today. Okay, next question. Um, I wanted to um, be sure to ask uh, folks on Zoom or remind folks on Zoom, please, to feel free to type in your questions on chat and we will get to those. So we know that you're in remote places, but we hope that you will engage with us um, as though you were here with us in the auditorium. Okay. All right, this next question. There is some confusion around eligibility to access emergency shelter for the immigrant community. Is there anyone on the panel who feels ready to clarify that? Okay, thank well, you, Well, if you Maria. please read first, because there's a lot of confusion about public charge impacting housing. So um, at the end of the day, emergency shelter is not part of the public charge rule. They should not be afraid of using it. They're entitled to it. There have not been changes that are going to impact that access. But obviously, this has to do with the confusion that they have added um, housing as one of the benefits as part of the public charge rule. And they have also changed the rules for the um, eligibility for housing for mixed 
household status for people who have mixed um, status in the household. But there's no changes. So if they need emergency shelter, they should definitely apply for emergency shelter. Thank you. And uh, just to add to that, in general, anyone, as long as a member of their household has an immigration status, including crew call, they're eligible for emergency assistance shelter. Um, it does not need to be the parent. Thank you. And also as a reminder for approval, call, you need to have a, something pending. You don't even necessarily have to have a grant. So submitting an application um, can get you into that. Okay. All right. Any additional quote? Thank you. Okay, you're like magic. If it takes over two years to process an MDA application, when does the clock start ticking if the deferment only lasts two years? Okay, that's a great question. So the clock starts ticking for the deferment itself on the date of the grant. Um, the problem is that you can't apply for deferred action until you are out of status. So if you say enter on a B2 and you're granted six months, before you've overstayed, you can't apply until you're not in status anymore, then you're not going to be in status for however long it takes them to actually grant the deferred action. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any additional questions? Thank you. All right. This is a nice, simple one for you. What is the phone number of the legal ed, um, advice line at Children's? What's the contact information? Um, so you can call 617-919-6149, or you can send an email to ogc.legaladvocacyrequest at childrens.harvard.edu, which is a very long uh, email address. Um, you can also try 617-919-1312. Would you mind just saying that one more time for us? Yep. Just uh, Two phone numbers. My direct line is 617-919-6149. Um, my colleague's line is 617-919-1312 and our email address is ogc.legaladvocacyrequest at children.harvard.edu. Thank you. Kayla, okay, I was wondering if you could describe a little bit about the function, your role and the office because I feel like we haven't really had an opportunity to unpack that yet. Uh, thanks. So the, our office is the Office of Immigration Services within the Office of General Counsel. Um, and as my bio states, we process the um, employment visas for uh, the majority of the employee, international employees here at the hospital. So on various types of visas, primarily J-1 exchange visitor and H-1B employment visas. Um, we also assist many of our employees with um, sponsoring them for permanent residency. Um, so right now we have about 750 uh, uh, visa holders here at the hospital who are sponsored through our office. And then in addition to that, there's another um, 250 to 300 who have their own status, their own employment authorization that they've gotten through um, other types of visas mm. or spouses um, here at the hospital. And so um, I know there was a period of time earlier where um, we were seeing there were a lot of questions coming up in the during travel bans, et cetera, where you were um, being asked for a lot of assistance. Could you talk a little bit about the kinds of things that are coming to you now? Sure. Um, so right now we are still dealing with the, um, the Supreme Court upholding the most recent iteration of the travel ban. Um, so there are we are having some issues still with trying to get um, foreign nationals from certain countries into the United States. Um, we have one uh, research fellow in particular who has been waiting for over six months for her visa to be issued. Um, so we're trying to do what we can to assist her. Um, so those are the things that, that we're seeing now for certain countries. We are certainly having issues. Um, for employment visas, specifically H-1B visas, we are having um, a lot of, of issues um, where we're seeing the Immigration Service request evidence that they've never requested before, um, really in unprecedented numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the work that we're doing is certainly much more difficult than it ever has been. Um, the volume, fortunately, is the same. We, we still, people still want to come to the United States yes. and still want to work at, here at Children's, which is great. Um, so they're not deterred, which is, which is a good thing. It's wonderful. Um, 
So yeah, those are the, the issues that we're seeing and just really long, you know, long wait periods for in general for everything. Yeah. And it sounds like there in some of these other um, processes, we're seeing sort of in inexplicably long waits and just sort of not really having a sense of how to predict what's going to happen. And so that's one of the things that patient families are also dealing with is not having a sense of what we couldn't, can't even really estimate how long it's going to be. And so they may be holding out for a long time, which adds stress to the family, certainly. Um, Shanika, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the medical legal partnership, because I don't think that folks um, maybe necessarily fully appreciate what, you know, where that um, came about and what its role is and, and um, the work that you do in that regard. Sure. Um, and I forgot to add earlier that we have an internal web page. Um, so if you go to the general counsel's webpage, you can click on the link for medical legal partnership and it has all of our contact information. We're going to do uh, bi-monthly um, newsletters for updates on the law as well as our referral form. So the medical legal partnership program was started about four years ago by our uh, general counsel in an effort to better support families that have legal needs outside of their care. Um, we work with families that have housing concerns, immigration concerns, benefits, um, as well as education. And we work a lot with community partners um, to provide the legal services to the family. So, for example, um, the IIC came here and held uh, legal clinics at the hospital, as well as at Martha Elliott. Um, and we do a lot in the community to provide resources to families. Um, we get about a little over close to 300 referrals a year. Um, and much of the work is with um, immigration and housing. We have a relationship with GBLS where they take on uh, five uh, direct cases per month. And so it's really a resource for families um, that need legal assistance. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that explanation. So I have another question here. To clarify, does that mean if no one in the family has legal status, then they wouldn't be able to get shelter? reference to the emergency shelter question. Yes. Okay. So could you, um, yeah, so, could you state um, that? Yeah. So <laughs> in sure. Massachusetts is uh, one of the only states that has a right to shelter for families. Um, so in general, in order to be eligible, you need to have either be 21 years old or younger or have a child under 21 years old in the household. Um, and you need to have some sort of immigration status. Um, like was discussed earlier, even if they apply for something, that will get them into shelter. So if you're working with a family that has no immigration status and has never applied to anything, um, we can work with them to get them a status to get into shelter. Um, but currently, um, if they have no, uh, if no one in the household has any immigration status, they're not eligible for emergency assistance shelter, but they might be eligible for private shelters. Okay. Um, I have been um, provided with a program note to remind folks that this program is being recorded and that the recording and the slides will be available in the BCH Children's Advocacy Network CAN newsletter. Make sure you've signed in today, today's program to get this newsletter if you're not receiving it yet. It's a really, it's a, it's a great way to stay abreast of what we're working on and what our concerns are. Okay, I have a new question. What can be disclosed to ICE should they come to the hospital? If ICE comes to the hospital, please page the legal department at 6108. <laughs> <laughs> um, additionally, um, page the AOD, and we will work together to help guide whatever steps we need to take next. And I think that question is or a similar question in the FAQs, um, you know, go through your chain of command in your department, um, definitely page uh, OGC, um, social work and security as well. Yes, yep. thank mm -hmm. you. So um, as you may have seen on the internal web, um, we have uh, the announcement for today's presentation and there is a link embedded in that announcement which will um, guide, take you to the FAQs that are going, I think answering many of the questions that brought folks together here today. So it's a future reference for you. Families have questions about ICE raids. Are these raids happening in Boston? I don't know if I can answer that one. Yeah, I don't know. Um, oh, okay. 
what with Mira has been talking about, this is something to us, Mira Coalition, really. Um, That's been M I R A. The, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we can definitely follow up with them. I don't feel comfortable like saying that. We know that they're like anecdotal cases. Some of them is just the community freaking out about somebody in uniform. So mm -hmm. some of them are not confirmed. Um, I think that we need to follow up with Mira yeah. to confirm. Okay. I think that's the best bet. Okay, great. So we will we'll go ahead and uh, make a note of that and follow up with Mira, which is the Massachusetts Immigration Refugee, Re Refugee. Advocacy Coalition. And and advocacy we coalition. work very closely with them. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Okay. I went to a previous training and they said SSI was a benefit that was going to be included, considered in public charge. That has, has that since changed or will it be considered? So that is a cash benefit. And I talked about cash benefits being part of the current rule. So it's been part of the rule for a long time. So um, they pay attention to TANF, I think it is, SSI, mm -hmm. and another program, EADC, that's right. So those three are cash benefits and they have been part of the rule. It's nothing new. It's been part of it. Mm -hmm. And so basically that could potentially obstruct a path to naturalization for, for those individuals. It's, it can prevent them from accessing green cards. However, I just said that it's actually very easy to overcome a public charge test if they can provide an affidavit of support. Also think about the totality of circumstances. Using a benefit doesn't, it doesn't mean that the person is going to be denied because I talked to um, one of them, I think it was GBLS, um, gave me a case that made me understand this, which is there was this older man who was using cash benefits and he was going to sponsor their kid who was in China and had a degree. So his use of benefits was not going to prevent him from sponsoring this, his kid because his kid was actually going to be able to help him. Mm -hmm. So it's not black or white. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a very helpful message. Sorry, I also want to clarify something since you mentioned naturalization. Thank you. If someone is a green card holder already, the public charge rule does not apply to them. So in order to apply for citizenship, you have to have your green card already. What the public charge rule applies to is someone who does not have their green card yet and is applying for one. Thank so if you. you have a green card holder that wants to apply for benefits, please encourage them to do so. That's so important. Thank you for making that distinction. Also, pay attention. If they have to leave the country for six months, they can always talk to an immigration lawyer ahead of time because that might trigger an, another admissibility test on the way back. It is possible to leave the country for more than six months, but if the person already knows that they're dealing with something that's going to keep them away for that long, to talk to an immigration lawyer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Before they depart. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? In order for providers to have these conversations, the family has to out their status, reveal their status, which is of course difficult. Are there community-based efforts underway to educate families to undo the chilling effect? For example, neighbors, churches being educated by organizations. Yes, so there's a lot of big effort ongoing um, from different organizations. Mira is leading a lot of those efforts. We're training um, community leaders and community members. We're reaching out to churches, schools. Schools are a very important um, ally for us to get to the communities where they are. It's actually very hard, very hard. Mm. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions? We got lots, okay, great. I was feeling like maybe the well was running dry. This is good. If public charge rule does go into effect, does it act retroactively for the people accessing these services beforehand? No. So I clarified that until the ruling is not in place, um, they're not going to be using anything like the definition, the test, the forms. And even when the ruling comes, they're not going to look retroactive to the services, use benefits and so forth until that point. So it will be forward looking. Okay, so the ruling comes down, the person disenrolls if, if yes. they can, then, then, that's, then they would be okay. So what we don't know is because they actually, as part of the finalized rule, people had 60 days to disenroll from benefits if needed. Um, if once the ruling comes down, the ruling will like be in effect the same day, well, they will have another period. We don't know that. Okay, 
Yeah. So exactly how it looks is unclear. Correct. So we don't want to give details because we really don't know. We don't know. Yeah. And this uncertainty. It's not going to be retroactive, which is the most important thing. Yes. Yes. And so it, I think this, you know, this sort of brings up an important point for all of us, which is these are changing um, issues, right? So it's very moment to moment. So what you know right now may be different literally tomorrow. So we're asking people to verify the facts, to consult people um, who are attending to these details and to be very sure that when we're sharing information with patient families, that we're relying on the most up-to-date understanding. That is a very good point. In fact, um, we're part of the national campaign that's paying attention to a lot of these issues. We get two emails a day with something new. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. And I think that fatigue is is part of what's wearing on people is that sense of they don't know what's coming next. And um, and so all of us are really charged with um, maintaining the energy to be able to stay attuned to what's a happening. A good example is the fact that the public charge rule was said to be in effect on October 15th and then we got the injunction. That was the Tuesday after the holiday. And then we had the injunction on Friday and then communicating to the community that that's actually not going to be into effect, it's actually very hard. Plus, I always say the damage had been done. Yeah. Because it was just, the chilling effect was there. It doesn't matter how many things you change, if you implement it or not, people are already dropping benefits. Yeah. So it's getting the information across, that's the hard part. Yes, yes. Great. Thank you. This is from Maria. If the new revised public charge rule were to go into effect, would the group of people affected expand to include asylum seekers, refugees, UAC, DACA recipients, et cetera? No, that's actually a statute and it cannot be changed. Okay. So the categories of people exempted stays. Okay. I think that's, question. yeah, that's a great question. So th because things are so variable, it's hard to remember that there are some guideposts that remain somewhat fixed unless they, there is a legislative change. Correct. Thank you. Okay. What can we do here at Boston Children's when we have a child with a long-term complex medical need and the family has just arrived? They have Mass Health Limited, CMSP, and need lots of care and services, medication that are not covered by insurance. You can contact the Medical Legal Partnership Program. Uh, we've helped families in the past with that exact issue, uh, working with Health Law Advocates and Iris and National Immigrant Center to get them both the health insurance as well as health care for all they need. So contact the Medical Legal Partnership Program. We'll put them in touch with a lawyer. That's wonderful. And I'm going to make a plug here for um, some of the work that Healthcare for All is doing because we understand that CMSP has limitations for some of these children and they need medications, equipment that are not covered. So we have right now a legislative proposal at the state house um, to ensure that these children actually have access to full mass health, which is a benefit they would be entitled to if it wasn't because of the immigration status. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, this is opening up sort of a new topic for us, which I think is wonderful. Thank you for your questions. Unaccompanied minors, asylum seekers, what happens when they turn 18? Is the sponsor still responsible for them when their status is established? You, do you understand the question? Um, like I said before, Irish doesn't practice asylum law, so I am actually not, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Anybody else want to take a stab at that? Okay, this is, this is out of our scope, and I think that's an important, also an important reminder for all of us that this is extremely complex and the expertise of people to develop is, um, is broad, but it doesn't necessarily mean we're prepared to answer everything. So I think that just makes the point that every organization that provides pro bono services specializes in some of the services. Immigration law is huge. Yes. So it depends on like, there's some of them that do a lot of asylum, asylum um, applications. So they might be more versed in this. Okay. Does anybody have a sense of a resource that we might consider if we're talking about asylum seekers? Catholic Charities does a lot of asylum um, work. Okay, great. Thank you. And Harvard Law School has an asylum clinic. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes. 
the so PAIR project. Let me go back that we have a list of organizations that provide immigration services or an immigrant health toolkit. You guys should sign up on it because it has by region where you got, can send them. Um, and I know that most of them can tell you like, who does what kind of services. Oh, okay, great. Yep. So those are categorized. And similarly on the Medical Legal Partnership uh, Program's website, we have an advocacy call card and it has a list of all the immigration um, legal resources in the area as well as what they specialize in. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, here's another question about unaccompanied minors. Should a 16-year-old unaccompanied minor seek legal assistance with his immigration with his immigration status, he may be eligible for asylum. Um, he's in DCF custody. Does this fall into that category again? The question is just, should someone seek legal assistance? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, there's no, never any harm in calling a lawyer. So do it. Okay, great. That's a good plug. So um, it sounds like if an individual is an unaccompanied minor has found their way in DCF custody, that um, it would behoove them to access legal assistance to sort out their, their immigration status. Okay. I work with some families who have medical deferred action or are actively applying. Um, they qualify for shelter, but which subsidized housing programs are they eligible for? It's, it's limited if it's a federal, particularly if it's a federal subsidized um, housing program. So it's limited. Yeah, yes. They'll be eligible for some mass things like mass rental vouchers, um, but in terms of federal subsidies and less well, right now, unless one of them has a more solid status that's not crew called, but something even more substantive than that, they're not going to be eligible for federal stuff. Okay. So uh, say I'm, I, I fall into that category and I go to my local housing authority and I express an interest in um, accessing subsidized housing, do I apply and they, they would let me know which ones I'm allowed to apply for there? Is that how it would work? I don't think they let you know. Um, in general, the wait list for subsidized housing, um, no matter your status, it could be as long as 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, so you can always put your, but your if you're in a shelter, um, whoever is your um, social worker at the shelter will let you know which ones you qualify for. Yeah, so working with a housing advocate or someone there who has that expertise, which is another, um, not quite at the pace perhaps of immigration law right now, but um, eligibility for housing and shelter is something that is, feels as though it's also the sands are always shifting under our feet. Thank you. What is happening with immigrants and the census? How can we as providers reinforce illegal immigrants to participate in the census and will this affect them? My understanding is that the census question was blocked. Yes. So um, the, the citizenship question will not be on the census. That doesn't mean just like with the healthcare enrollment and people getting off their benefits that that, that damage hasn't already been done. Um, but there are organizations, I believe, including Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, that are doing big pushes to make sure that people know that that question won't be on there, that it's really, really important to respond to the census. Yes. Does someone who would want to talk a little bit about why the census is so important? Well, I was just saying that that's how you, you, they have the formula for some of our federal funding that comes for programs such as important as Medicaid, for example, for, and I can talk about that because that's what we work on. I just want to say one thing that we can do to help our communities is to actually call them undocumented immigrants and not illegal. Um, we're just going to start with the language, Thank um, you. just as a basic thing so that we're all on the same page. Yes. Um, but in terms of the census, we know that the damage has been done. We know that it's not just the question that has been an issue, it's the investment in the census outreach. Um, we know 10 years ago that they were... Um, work outreach workers for the census in every neighborhood and this time around they have a very limited number so this is all like concerted effort of like dim diminishing the responses on the census it's really telling people that they should fill out the census that there's nothing you know to be concerned about and in fact it's very important for our communities yes because the resources are directly tied to those numbers OK, 
can we consider putting up signs at Boston Children's Hospital in different languages, directing people to vetted resources? Um, yeah, the, the plan is to bring that to the um, internal immigration policy group and see what can be done about that. Okay, and as the person with oversight of interpreter services, I'd like to offer our services for translation in order to, to move that along. Okay. Do people seeking permanent legal status need to prove that they have health insurance? They don't need to prove that, not because of their legal status, is because we actually have an individual mandate in Massachusetts technically. So people who reside in Massachusetts have to have health insurance or they can face um, an appell we call it an assessment. Um, we just, in Massachusetts, we have a law since 2006 and then we have the ACA implemented, but we still keep the requirement of people that they need health insurance that meet our standards. So it has nothing to do with immigration. It, that applies to everybody in the state. Okay, in the state. Everybody who can qualify for programs. So we understand, for example, that coverage, health safety net is not technically coverage. So that doesn't count towards coverage. Um, but anybody who qualifies for coverage needs to have co coverage. Okay. Um, I think that that question was secondary to a recent um, announcement. Um, yeah, so that has to do with the proclamation that I was talking about. Yes, yes. The proclamation does not impact people that are in the country. That proclamation is for people who are applying for immigrant visas overseas. So these are really people who are applying through family petitions for the most part. Um, if we go kind of like back and look at all these policies, what they're trying to do is to reduce the number of family petitions. So this is just another barrier for family members to bring the family members from other countries. This is for the consular process. So it has nothing to do with people who are in Massachusetts. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Any additional comments? There's litigation announced yesterday. Uh, yeah, I, I was waiting for that. I thought that was coming. So, um, and so this is really... Um, just these are examples of various branches of government um, intervening um, to slow things down and give us that that opportunity to look at um, whether things are in the best interest so of our citizens and others. Um, how do state laws impact immigrant children and their families? For example, access to health care. How do state laws impact immigrant children and their families? For example, access to health care. Well, it does have an impact because um, our health care programs are, some of them are um, federally funded, but some of them are state funded. So any changes in the state that we do to increase access has, can have an impact. And that's the example that I gave before when we have this program called called Children Medical Security Plan that, yes, covers a lot of the services for children who had no status, but at the end of the day has a lot of limitations and our state has the power to increase access to services for those children. So state law has a lot, a big, big role to play for services for our children in general. Mm -hmm. uh, just to add, and you can add as well, um, in addition, um, if you're undocumented, you qualify for very limited health insurance, um, Mass Health Limited. It doesn't cover a lot of out of hospital care. Yes. So it's only for um, emergencies, really. It's health safety net and, and Mass Health Limited are really for like emergency services. Health safety net actually can cover some of the stuff, but Mass Health Limited is really the ambulances included, which is like the very important thing. But that's just emergency. That's what's called emergency Medicaid mm -hmm. for emergencies. Thank you. Is there anything that we can do to advocate for medical deferred action now? Um, <laughs> I don't necessarily think so, just because um, in theory, my take is that DHS's position, the Department of Homeland Security's position, is that this has been restarted. Um, in terms of advocating for things like, like actually adjudicating applications after they're filed, um, it is very difficult to figure out who to 
talk to and then also to figure out whether talking to anybody would actually make an impact at all. Mm -hmm. um, so we have tried to have internal discussions with um, like the, the director of the USCIS office and the regional director um, that have not been super productive. So I, I don't know that there's anything more that, that can be done right now, okay. unfortunately. Okay, so on the on the macro level, no, but on the um, individual level, all the things that we've described already in terms of getting people the right information at the right time. Yes. Okay. How are attorneys that serve undocumented people, such as those at the IIIC, paid for? A bunch of different ways. Um, we get some funding from partnerships with other organizations. We get some funding from the Irish government, um, a very small amount, um, and from private donors. We just had our, our big fundraising gala a couple weeks ago, um, and I think that that's where the bulk of legal services funding is actually coming from right now. So it's philanthropically supported. So if an individual comes to you and you support them, they don't have to pay you. So that's correct, yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, we, we charge in some cases based okay. on an individual's ability to pay. Okay, so it's a needs-based yeah. assessment for those services. Great. Do you know of any free or low cost mental health services available to undocumented immigrants over 21? Mental health assistance? Yes. Okay, so that's another um, barrier that we still have in Massachusetts, which is the fact that access to mental health services and behavioral health services are not um, available to everybody at the level that they should be. So that's when we can say the state can play another role. Um, we can look into it to give you more examples because there are services out there. I don't have the list here. So we could always look and, and find um, specific services, but it's very limited. Okay. Did you, um, I think there are a couple of folks in the audience who had additional comments to add um, to in response to that or, yeah, okay. So the adult homeless shelters, you can't bring a minor into. Right. So it would only be for adults 18 and above. But there are uh, mental health services. There's case management. Um, there's all kind. There's a health healthcare for the homeless has a clinic there. And there's also the homeless outreach team, which is through the Department of Mental Health, DMH. And there are multiple teams that visit all of the homeless shelters in Boston and have different sites. Um, so uh, through DMH, if someone qualifies for like an Axis 1 or Axis 2 diagnosis, they would be able to be approved for DMH services, but also the homeless shelters are a good resource. And are those resources available to only those who happen to be homeless? Um, actually, no, that, that um, so for example, the overnight shelters, yes. Um, but I think that, you know, they're not, they're not doing an evaluation to let you in the door. I mean, if right. you show up, um, they're going to let you in. Um, but many low income fam, you know, adults, not families, um, like for example, St. Francis house provides breakfast and lunch. Oh, great. Um, and also the, the medical care, um, a lot of things like diabetic care or, um, you know, any, there's also detox services available. Um, so there's a lot of resources there. Thank you. So let me just add that this also depends on coverage. So we're taking into account that this person probably does not qualify for a coverage that includes mental health. Yes. My, um, my first instinct is to send the person to our helpline to ensure that what the coverage they have um, to kind of like they can check into which plan they have, what kind of coverage and what it covers and where they can go get services first. And if you really cannot access any of that, then we can look into other services such as the ones you provided here. First look at the coverage, right? Yes, yeah, so we have one more response to this. Thank you very much. 
There's also a resource that I recently um, heard about, which is called Community Caring Clinic, and it's in Roxbury, and they support specifically refugee and asylum seekers with um, mental health, and I don't believe that it's insurance-based. Um, and then there's a program in Cambridge I'm forgetting the name for, but I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, uh, for folks who aren't aware, uh, the Family Resource Centers of Massachusetts, um, of which I was a former director, so I know a lot about. Um, they have um, 24 sites all across the state, and they are a wonderful resource for undocumented folks because they have no eligibility criteria, and they should know in their area where these types of resources are. So just wanted to mention that as well. So, Thank you. And we have another comment from Al. Here it comes. Um, so I think the one you're talking about in Cambridge is the Novo, which is used to be the legal service agency, the name of the legal service agency in Cambridge. Yeah. And it says if you're uninsured or having difficulty ex accessing affordable counseling through your insurance, you can call them uh, from nine to five and they have their number Monday through Friday. Wonderful. So, and, and then the, I've, you know, I've worked with adults before. I worked at Martha Elliott when they still saw adults and we had a lot of uh, adults who were undocumented, they came and they got their care, mental health care there. So I think it's more like community health centers, places that already are providing their medical care can also provide the mental health care. It's just like the, you said before, it's limited. And so people might be at capacity and that just be waiting like everybody else is waiting. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. That is, that concludes all of the index card questions. And I just want to really extend my gratitude to our panelists for being here, from coming from out far, far away, because everywhere is far away if you're trying to travel across the city. And, um, and certainly um, to our, all our folks who contributed to making this happen and for all of you for being here. This is such important work and work that we're going to continue to do moving forward. So thank you for caring so much about our patients and families. And we thank you for being here. Our panelists will be here till one o'clock. So if you have questions that you'd like or conversations you'd like to have before we all disembark, um, feel free to come on up and have a chat. Thank you so much.